And it's recording. One. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and turn off my video. Okay, two, four, five. Uh, I think we'll give it, I don't know, at least three or four minutes and, and then we'll start. Um, I know we have- Yeah, I like to go by the popcorn method. Yeah, I know we Just have- like, You know, when like the popcorn, when, it, when they're ready, they start, they start popping like less frequently. Yeah. So same with attendees, you know, or entrance to it, like people to, who are at seminars, pop, 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 and then pop, pop, like once it's kind of, you know, a second between pops, that's when you know it's ready. Yeah, so welcome everyone. As we're just waiting for people to join. We'll start in a few minutes. So we mentioned that this is being recorded as though that should somehow make me not talk about the popcorn method. I don't know. I think the popcorn method is like scientifically the best method for. <laughs> and it's, it's 11 PM here. I've never, yeah, I'd never heard of that before, but actually I will use that. Um, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, so. now you have a name for it. Right? Exactly. And it's 11 PM here. So like whatever I say basically is, you know, not be used in a court of law, so it <laughs> cannot be used against me. We're just going to assume that Subu is going to edit out all of this this intro popcorn method discussion, anyways, if it ever gets posted or circulated. Or maybe that'll be the best part. I mean, I hope not. Uh, you guys are surely going to say very smart things after this, but <laughs> if nothing else, people can walk away with the popcorn. Mm. <laughs> I'm a talker, in case y'all didn't notice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can give it two more minutes and then we'll, we'll sort of pop in. Yeah, exactly. Afrigare and this webinar, born of tweets and serendipity, right? People just coming together to talk about and join forces about um, things they're, they're interested in and think are important. Hi there. Hi, How's it going? I don't think we've ever met in person, but it's good to see you. I think we I'm actually sure. have, although you wouldn't remember, but I remember because I was a prospective PhD student visiting Duke considering attending the Nick School. And I chatted with you. Uh, <laughs> God knows when, 2008, nine? I had just come back to Duke, so uh, allow me a 13 year fog here. I also had long dreadlocks, so like you're very, you know, I've taken I'm not them. Super, <laughs> you're forgiven more than. <laughs> I'm just going to. I have a espresso machine. No surprise, Hisham, in my home cave. So I'm going to turn that on. So guys, I'm muting myself in case you start. I'm here. For attendees who've just joined us, we're, we're just uh, waiting a couple of minutes to, to get started. Like this would be a much less awkward silence in, in a real life panel session, right? Because you can actually chit chat in a non crazy way. But yeah, I just chit chat anyway. Should I share my screen with that, with a tweet that started it all? I think. It, it has to happen at some point, whether that's now or later, it's, it's completely up to you. So I think that would be pretty great. Oh, between, the, between us and the 
What's the time difference? Very good question. Well, it's 11 p.m. for me. 6 a.m. 6 a.m. for me. Um, 6 a.m. Pacific. Yep. Yep. So. So somebody, I don't do, you know, algebra. Someone <laughs> do the math. Mike, you're an engineer. <laughs> What's the time difference? <laughs> a lot more than it should be. Yeah. And it's a lot less if you go backwards. You know, so that's just that's seven right. hours. You, you right? shouldn't yeah. fly this way, just fly the other way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. We just change days, then it's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, so we somehow made it from um, spice masalas to clean cook stoves and development impact bonds in a tweet thread and ended up finally, ultimately with uh, um, a webinar on cook stoves. All thanks to the beautiful and dreadfully, you know, okay, let me, let me start. All thanks to cost benefit analysis. I'll just skip the adjectives. <laughs> I taught it for five years, so I, I have the right to say whatever I want about benefit analysis. Okay, zipping it, Mike's counting down. All right, I, I feel like the popcorn has uh, has slowed. Um, there are a fair number of people that registered that that are not here, but that's okay. Um, maybe we'll get some that pop in in the middle. And uh, I think at some point we will we're going to talk about some way to maybe make this uh, widely available afterwards. Um, so we can go ahead and uh, get started and. Go ahead and start to so um welcome everyone <laughs> for to uh the what was supposed to be the second but is now the first uh africa uh, webinar series um thank you all for being here and i will just give a quick presentation um just in case anyone doesn't know what africa is um what we're trying to do what we're what we're all about um that, that, that would you know, try and try and give you some information here. Um, so Africa is really this this project, as as Subu has said, kind of born of uh, of serendipity and and just people being uh, connected at, at the right time and the right place. Um, but really, all we're trying to do is increase air quality infrastructure and capacity building in Africa, right? And specifically in ways that are sustainable um, and accessible. Right. Uh, see if I can. Okay. Um, so right now, uh, Africa is a consortium of 15 institutes um, across the globe, uh, a number in, in, in Africa, as well as the, the US and Europe and, and Australia. Um, and, we're, and we're really multidisciplinary, right? We're composed of atmospheric scientists, uh, epidemiologists, economists, and a number of other uh, different disciplines, right? Um, and this is this is important because this is what you need when you're trying to tackle a problem such as you know, actually increasing air quality, monitoring and capacity, and and really trying to substantially improve air quality where you, where you can. Um, so right now we have about three overarching goals uh, that you know broadly put are, are about infrastructure development, right? We want to get uh, monitors for, for air quality in uh, across Africa, um, capacity building. You know, we want the local partners and scientists in Africa to have the skills um, to not just run the sensors, but you know, analyze the sensors and, and make sure that uh, what what we're what we're getting is is you know high quality and you know, actionable and um, you know, can really make long-term improvements. Um, and as well, you know, we also really care about this, this idea of open access data, right? Uh, if we have all these sensors running, but no one can see the data except us, then 
there's not much that we can really do about it, right? There's the 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 action the actionable items that you can do on that are, are very limited. Um, and you know, again, we want this all to be you know sustainable in the long term, right? And so that's everything we try we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that they're they're, they're lasting actions and and there's institutional knowledge that's built up and institutional infrastructure that's built up. Um, you know, right now we have uh, a number of different focus areas in, inside those, those broad objectives, um, including low cost sensors and evaluating how they perform across Africa uh, in different climates and different areas, uh, and various low cost sensor makes, um, as well as, you know, integra integrating ground sensor data with, with satellite data and with model data um you know verifying these kind of these air quality models um and you know just overall broadly investigating uh, air pollution health effects which is something that we'll touch on a little bit later today um i will mention that we are in the process of deploying 25 uh, t ohms these are uh reference grade pm 2.5 monitors so when you're if uh, yeah, these would be used by the US EPA or, or any other um, uh, EU standards um, to measure PM 2.5 mass. Um, and right now we have uh, a number of countries that we plan on deploying these um, with, a, with a fairly long-term uh, de deployment goal of 10 years, um, having these things operational for, for again, you know, this, this sustainable action. Um, and, you know, th this is, I'm not gonna talk about this much more, but um, this is something that you need. You need these reference monitors to be able to have uh, quality low cost sensor deployments as well. Um, so we, we hope that in, in the next year or so, you know, a lot of these are gonna start coming online and, and you'll start being able to access data from this. Um, in terms of what we're doing in, in, in terms of outreach and, and capacity building, right? So there's this webinar series, um, the first one, which was supposed to be last month, um, had to be rescheduled due to a number of conflicting issues, but um, that was going to be a spotlight on specifically African researchers um, talking broadly about air quality issues in Africa. Um, uh, there will be a uh, Twitter blast and another flyer to you know, really uh, talk about that one uh, coming out shortly. Um, we have this one now in July 2021, um, which we're at talking about cook stoves. Um, and next month, we're we're planning on having ANGA, the African Group of on Atmospheric Sciences, which is uh, primarily South and Southern African based, um, but is actually Pan African, um, discussing about what they're doing and and what ANGA as a whole is is trying to accomplish, um, and. Uh, Later this month, we'll also be giving a tutorial on low cost PM sensors, uh, specifically how to use them and calibrate them and uh, account for all the issues and potentialities that um, come up with, with their use. Um, that'll be later this month. Yeah, so uh, with that, uh, welcome again. Um, I will let all of our panelists introduce ourselves. I'm going to hand it over to Amelia to, to really uh, get us started here. but. Um, yeah, thank you again for coming. So I will go yeah. ahead and stop my share. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so fellow panelists, what do you think? Um, should we do the little poll first or introduce ourselves first? Any thoughts? We didn't discuss that. I have a poll. Why don't we go Why don't we do introductions? Yeah, I was gonna say- I was gonna say, okay. through, do introductions first because then people Wonderful. know who they're- their, uh, yeah, exactly. So who, who's who's going to be listening to the poll? So um, we're following along. So I'll go first. Um, I'm Amelia Transtrom. I'm currently in Australia, in Sydney, in the third week of, uh, of an unexpected lockdown. Um, we're kind of going backwards as the rest of the world is going forward. Um, it's 11 p.m. Forgive me if I say crazy things. I'm an economist. Uh, so again, that's another caveat, right? Um, but basically, I somehow got this conversation started by talking about spice masalas, labor productivity, um, and women's time, and then everyone started chiming in, and we had a really fruitful discussion on Twitter about uh, about cookstoves, and that's really the focus of today. Um, I'm gonna I mostly focus on development economics, 
I know next to nothing about cook stoves, and so I'm really excited to be here. I'm just going to be kind of poking everyone about how to value benefits because I taught cost benefit analysis for a very long time. Or it seems like a very long time. And, uh, and so that's, that's really my role here. I'm going to help Mike um, moderate a little bit um, on the sort of social science side. And um, yeah, so I'll hand it off to, uh, to, so I'm at the University of Sydney, the School of Economics. I should probably mention that. Um, I'll hand it off to, to Jill. Do you want to introduce yourself? You're next to me in the Zoom pictures, so. Perfect. Um, <laughs> So hi everyone, uh, I'm Jill Baumgartner. Um, I'm an epidemiologist at McGill University in Canada. And um, so a, a lot of a lot of my work, it's, it's interesting, I didn't actually realize all the amazing work that was happening around uh, sensors for F-Care. So that was great to see because that's amazing. Um, and it's gonna be a phenomenal resource and much needed resource. So I think I'm still recovering from my excitement from that. Um, but, uh, but so I, um, I've worked on cook stoves evaluation uh, a bit. So we're evaluating, uh, we've evaluated and are evaluating programs that are happening in China and India, um, and also worked on a lot of air quality issues more generally. Um, so working on how do we measure exposure in settings where people are, you know, a big source of exposure is inside the home, but there's also, you know, high levels of outdoor air pollution. How do we try to uh, differentiate between indoor versus outdoor. Um, lots of collaborations uh, with uh, engineers and social scientists and um, people working in also in health sciences and in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and thanks so much for the invitation to be here. I, I really respect everyone on the panel. I know all of your work, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear your, uh, your thoughts on a lot of these, these topics and issues. I'll just oh, and go I'll, around I'll, my little. I was going to say, uh, pass it on. Call him. Hisham is next to me in the pictures. So, great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hisham Zarifi, um, and it's six a.m. for me, as people who heard the early chat uh, know. So, I also uh, uh, disavow anything I might say into the future if it sounds uh, a little wacky. Um, so I am uh, in the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia, um, but I am not a forester. Uh, my background is more in energy systems from both a technical and a social science perspective. Uh, so I do sort of interdisciplinary work, uh, looking at uh, a lot of work on energy access, both electricity and clean cooking over the last decade and a half uh, at sort of three levels, sort of the household community level in terms of decision-making impacts, uh, outcomes, uh, then sort of at the systems level with some modeling work, um, and these kinds of things. And then also another level, which is thinking about kind of governments, markets, policies, subsidies, uh, these kinds of uh, parts of the solution space. Um, and I guess I'll stop there. And you'll I guess, probably hear a little bit or figure out a little bit more of what I do and how I approach things course of the webinar. Pass it on to Subrendu. Hey everyone, uh, this is Subrendu Patnaik. Hopefully you can hear me. You'll get some thumbs down if, uh, if that's not working. I didn't know we were doing introductions. I, I mostly am overhead at this point in the sense that I'm director of uh, two PhD programs, so I just approve random things that I don't understand. Um, but other than that, I've done, I'm on the social science side of things. So trained as an economist right now, I don't really care what I'm doing in terms of I'm trying to solve the problem. So that's mostly been understanding how these seemingly low cost technologies like cook stoves, like toilets, like bed nets that seem to have some potential to alleviate health problems that come from the environment um, don't seem to fly. So either these are related to accessibility issues, acceptability issues, not so much affordability, which everyone seems to understand that if you give subsidies, they work. I'm, I'm tired of studies that prove when you subsidize something, uh, people buy it, or sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I think that's the least challenging of all problems. Um, there are other issues and that's what I've beaten my head on. And um, I think just to connect a little bit with what Mike said earlier, and then I'll shut up. So air pollution is obviously a huge problem. It wasn't discovered as a huge problem, at least not within the household space till a 
few folks really pushed on it hard. Now it's clear that it, it is still a silent killer, a, a really major, major, uh, potentially destructive thing out there. Um, and there are some technologies that can deal with it. And the question is that, uh, I, I think as the social scientists here will point out, those technologies don't only deal with air pollution, they also do other things. And so uh, do you throw the baby out with the bath, bath water to draw an analogy, if you have a technology that isn't quite working for some people for some things. And hopefully that provides a segue to the conversation that follows. Unlike Emilia and Hisham, I do not have a good reason for not making sense. I don't make sense most of the time. So sorry about that. That's just it. You're just being consistent. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I made, I didn't say that I normally make sense. I just made excuses for now. Um, so for attendees and panelists alike, I have a little poll for everyone. Um, so I'm going to share my screen quickly. And so if you, you can either go to slido.com and it'll give you a little thingamajig where you could enter Air. You can scan this QR code. Um, and then you would be able to see ultimately, I'll, I'll give you a second to just absorb that, slido.com. Air is the code, both A's are capitalized. I don't know if it'll block you if not. And then I'll start the poll in just a second. Um, we'll have a little word cloud. Um, and we're curious to hear um, what folks think, what words come to mind when you hear clean cook stoves. Um, everyone can see my screen. Give me a thumbs down if not. Brilliant. And we have our first reply. Maybe I should, maybe I should have hid the answers until I don't actually know how to do that. So, oh, hide results. Should I do that? No. Here, y'all are creative. We're seeing some answers popping in. Brilliant. You know, the whole Slido thing is I'm already learning about technology uh, adoption here. I have no idea what I'm doing out there, but gathering away. You know, teaching on Zoom. <laughs> taught me a lot of things. It's taught me that I don't like teaching on Zoom. That's good, one thing, but also that technology is great. <laughs> um, when you can't, you know, I'm, I really enjoy sort of interacting with students and it's very difficult to do uh, through a screen, I find. But so at least having some way of interacting, especially when classes are large. Um, yeah, so Slido is, is one. Well, we've seen, we're seeing some, uh, some words really pop out there. Um, I see one stove to rule them all. <laughs> um, several kind of and in the darkness, bind them. Yeah, right. <laughs> Out of the smoke cloud. Nah, not gonna try. Subsidies, engineers gone wild. I like that one. Does anyone want a t-shirt with that? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm giving Mike a hard time here. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it, you know, economists gone well. I'm sure somebody would, you know, has already come up with that. Subsidies, emissions, household energy, smoke free, exposure, families, clean question mark. I've seen a couple of times. Rocket stove, uptake, intervention. Great, I think by the popcorn method, we're just about getting there, right? Improved soot. All right, so panelists, any, any thoughts? What do you guys think about, is this um, gonna fit 
what you think about when you hear clean cook stoves? Or, or, or you know, are, is this sort of a, a different word cloud than, than you'd imagine? I, th I think it's pretty much what you would imagine is to kind of and split a little bit between essentially um, some of the engineering aspects, technical aspects like emissions, uh, specific specific technologies, you know, LPG, you know, we have tier four plus, and then and then on the other side you have some of the more social aspects, um, aspiration, uh, welfare, mind, but, uh, time savings, families, women. Um, the complexity of it, which I don't think is a technical complexity, right? The complexity of it is is, is not about the technology at all. It's it's, it's about the, the, the decision making, um, and so I think it's a it's a it, it's maybe probably a little bit. Uh, if I just look at the numbers, it's probably a little bit skewed towards the technical. But I think that's probably a function of who is probably on this. Uh, this <laughs> um, uh, but. Uh, but that's yeah, a, um, absolutely. Thanks. Any other thoughts? If not, we can. Yeah. I, I, I guess what, one of the points I was going to make in the 75 minutes we have left is, is so I'll say it out here. So clean loads up the word in, in terms of air pollution. And I understand Africa Air and Subu and Mike, and you know that's what you guys are working on. Yet improved is different in that it may be not clean, yeah. not clean enough yet, but there are some benefits associated with that. And that's that's been sort of a, a theme that I've picked up on some of the work done by others in this panel. And we have a big research project coming up and a paper that was just accepted last night on time savings um, from, from cook stoves uh, across six countries. And so, wow. Yeah. And I think in a, in a think, lot of ways, that was where, where our discussion started, right, was, well, time savings is, is sorry, clean air is, is one aspect, time savings is another, um, or, you know, and, and whatever other benefits there may be. And so how do we think about kind of balancing those in, a, in sort of a, a fuller, or richer cost benefit analysis? Um, but I think to put us all on the same page, you all are on the same page, you all know a lot more about cook stoves than I do but we don't know where exactly our audience is coming from. So I think Mike has a couple of slides that he wanted to share and we'll, um, we can put together this word cloud and, um, and share that later as well. But I will stop my share for now. And, um, and yeah, Mike, do you wanna just get, you, you have a couple of slides you wanted to share on um, cook stoves? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, let me go ahead and share back to here. Okay. Um, advance. There we go. All right. Um, I, I feel like most people probably know know the gist of, of all that I'm going to say here, but you know, just as just as a quick recap and reminder, right? Uh, there's there's something like three billion people that cook over open fires you know, on on a, on a daily basis, um, and this action has a number of impacts, right? So there's a lot of illnesses that arise from this sort of open fire cooking. And the, the one of the most more recent estimates says that this poses a larger mortality burden than HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined, right? So this is this is quite impressive, like impressive in a very bad way, right? Um, you know, not only are we dealing with, with these health effects right, from indoor air pollution exposure, from particulate matter and carbon monoxide and ozone and black carbon soot um, via uh, volatile organic carbons and, and more, you know, because of that, we're, we're getting diseases ranging from COPD and asthma to lung cancer and even, even pregnancy effects, um, adverse pregnancy effects that, that happen because of this exposure. Um, but you know, not only that, right? There, there's also environmental effects. Uh, there's greenhouse gas release and, and black carbon release, which which is a potent climate forcer. Um, and there's potential forest and, and soil impacts depending on on the, the type of fuel that we're using in, in various places. Um, and, and and we're dealing with these economic impacts too, right? So 
of course, this exposure, this disease burden, this mortality burden uh, it has a loss of life and, a, um, and an inefficiency loss associated with that, right? Um, and so this, this, is, this is a real problem and the, the, the solution is not clear and not easy on how, how we do this, right? Um, you know, part of, part of when we're talking about cook stoves, right, is we're talking about these clean or cleaner stoves. Um, and just, just as a, as a, as a quick note, you know, quantifying the actual, um, exposure reductions that you get by changing stoves or, or changing fuels is, is actually uh, a fairly complicated, uh, question to answer. Um, and it's, it's very dependent on the specifics of, of, of the stove and the fuels that you're looking at and, and the switches between them all. Um, but this is an interesting little graph, right? So we can go from the basic three stone fire and just a couple of technologies are listed here. And, and you can see how we're getting uh, a pretty drastic reduction in, in not only PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5 reduction, but also right in uh, childhood pneumonia risk as well. Um, and I think that's all I had there. Um, yeah, so uh, just as you know, a, a brief refresher on, on why we actually care about these things. So uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Amelia. Well, I think at this point we're, um, the plan is just to launch into to a discussion. Um, so I, do you want me to start that off, Mike? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah, so. Folks, what do you all think? Um, I don't, um, in, in a sense, I think we, we all come at this uh, in, you know, from different angles, right? Um, and so, Sabrenda, you just mentioned, for example, that you, um, that you got something public, that you, something just got accepted related to, to time use. But maybe it would be worth the panelists just talking a little bit about your perceptions and sort of what, when you study cookstoves or, you know, what what improved cook stoves? I'm gonna say that rather than clean, right? Um, what are the main aspects that you think about? What are the benefits um, that you have valued that you think we should value? Is that a, a worthwhile place to start? And then we can um, let, let me kind of discuss how to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Let me tee up something for Gil and Hisham. Perfect, please. So so I think I think Gil is probably the the closest in terms of uh, air pollution and health effects in this panel. Uh, Isham and I sort of stay in between <laughs> this world and, 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 and the more social world, you know, God knows what we are, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, 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 for sure, the, clue, the clean cook stove, cook stove sector, the household energy sector has received a lot more attention because of the work by a whole bunch of public health and epidemiology folks saying, guess what? Number two in the disease burden, air pollution, household air pollution, shouldn't we be able to deal with this? Um, in fact, if anything, a lot of the science is coming out of the Western world and you know, the scientists are dealing with audiences who do not understand that there are three, four billion people who are affected by this, right? They're because they don't cook like this. So they have no concept that they switch a button, light comes on and like you know, there's coffee and there's stuff, right? They don't have to deal with smoke. So what Mike said earlier, let that sink in because seminar after seminar, when I'm standing up and saying, this is a problem around the world, people have no idea what I'm saying, right? They're thinking, Ohio air pollution, you know, something like that, or fires in, in California. And those are all bad, but this is this is like a fire in California every day in someone's house, right? That's basically what we're talking about. So so does does a household level technology actually relieve this burden? And uh, Jill and I have a paper. It's really Sarah Clark. I don't know if she's online or what I can't see the participants in 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 Tibet and uh, that she can talk about her work in China, which shows even the sort of the most glorified technology, a semi-gasifier is unable to sort of, you know, it's not really popular. It doesn't deliver some of the benefits. And she has other work in India, which the best of technologies fail in terms of under the current setting, okay? 
to bring down air pollution to the level that WHO, for example, thinks is safe, right? This 32 parts per million or I forget what the number is. It's even the best technologies on the ground. In the lab, they're fine. On the ground are falling short of this goal. Uh, but does that mean, let's let's just leave it there and then we'll come back to where, what does that mean for work in this sector? Yeah. Yeah, so can I can I just hop in with a question to the panelists and you know, not a rhetorical question at all? How, how do we square that with the graph that Mike just showed us of how great these stoves are in terms of improving air and childhood pneumonia and whatnot? So were those the lab results? Were those as optimistic? Um, is that one setting where it did work? Is it just on uptake or you know, fil treatment on the treated or you know, based on using them correctly? Or like what, what are all the things? How can I square this world where some people are telling me that these are the best things in sliced bread, even better because you can make toast, right? And others are saying, hey, no, really, people don't like them. They don't work. There's no uptake. Which of these is right? Is all of it right? Is it context dependent? Explain to me. Like I'm a two year old and it's 11 40. Mr. Jill and Hisham on my screen. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Challenge. Jill. I'll, I'll jump in after it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Hisham. You go. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, it's uh, it's lab versus field performance is part of it, for sure, in terms of some of the more advanced technologies that are that are biomass based in particular, right? Um, the second is our favorite word stacking. Uh, you know, people use uh, uh, the new technology, uh, but not exclusively, it's certainly not at the beginning of that. So a large part of what I, I study is sort of the transition to to uh, of, of usage patterns, um, but you know that's true of us as well. I mean, you know, I've got I don't know how many cooking devices in my in my kitchen. Now they happen to all use the same fuel, but I use different cooking devices because they do things differently. And some of these new devices don't cook the same way that the old thing did. And so people will use what's sort of optimal for them for their cooking tasks uh, naturally, right? Yeah, right. I mean, um, if you were going to tell me that I have to make a curry and um and rice and something else like with one plate how long yeah, is exactly. that going to so, take right if you give me two yeah. it's better yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so another yeah so another factor is just um you know just sort of some of the behavioral aspects in terms of why people might want not want to to use the stove itself in addition to the stacking you know as that becomes goes into the stacking piece um you know a a third aspect of this uh, is that it there's community level air pollution effects, and Jill could talk about this probably a little bit better than I I, I could. But but the fact of the matter is, if if one household in a in a community is using a, a you know the LPG or or even electricity, you know the cleanest stove, I mean there's there's still a lot of other air pollution happening around, and it's going to infiltrate into the house, right? Um, and so you you're going to get you know effects that are not quite as high as you would expect from a health perspective uh, for that reason. I think a big part of this is that is is that the the the, the technology on the one side and the behavior on the other, right? And, and we can talk more about that behavioral aspect of it in terms of, of why people do or do not want to take up and use these stoves exclusively, because you need the exclusive usage of those cleanest stoves in order to get that ramp down that curve that Mike showed, right? It doesn't it doesn't work even if you use a traditional stove for fifteen percent of the time. Right? you're not going to hit that really clean down box. Those things are just so dirty from, a, from an air pollution perspective. But wouldn't we still expect to see some reduction? Yeah, so you might not hit whatever the threshold is, but is that relevant? Like, you know, from a social wealth, from a welfare increasing perspective, if we reduce the amount of emissions that children and women are exposed to by half, that still seems like it's a success, even if there's remaining um, pollution, no? So, I mean, I, I think, um, so I'll, I'll pick up, I agree with everything that Hisham was just saying. Uh, those are, that he really well summarized sort of the challenges for achieving the reductions that are shown in that plot. Like, um, so uh, we do a lot of, 
field measurements of air quality. So we try to, to sort of evaluate you know, what's the outdoor air quality, what's the community air quality, what's the indoor air quality, and what's the personal exposure, and through that really try to understand what's happening. And then we we will, you know, do some fancy chemical analysis on air pollution samples to understand the different sources. And I mean, I think both with our studies and with reviews, so I work a lot in, in Asia, but also looking at work that um, people like Rafael Arku have led in, in Ghana, um, you know, looking at the, the sources of exposure that people have, like even when you look at household concentrations and definitely at personal exposures, household biomass stoves are contributing to about 30 to 35% of people's mm -hmm. overall air pollution exposure, right? So, so this is biomass, this is coming, you know, this is your neighbor's biomass stove. And, and this is not like we don't have a uh, some of these studies were rural, some of them were done in, in more peri-urban areas, so there's uh, certainly a greater impact that's coming from, you know, urban sort of air, to air pollution industry, things like that. Um, but these are really complex settings, right? So there's lots of different sources of air pollution that's coming from agriculture, farm equipment, you know, uh, uh, I mean, traffic, right? So people are increasingly sort of nearby roads, right? There's a village that's next to a road and the cars are not that clean. So it, in some ways, starting out with this, even a 50%, like if only 35% or 30 to 35% of your PM is coming from biomass stoves, then expecting a 50% reduction, that's just not going to happen, right? Um, and so I think probably what something important that we've learned over the past like 10 to 15 years is that like, you're not likely going to be able to reduce, you know, all of people's air pollution exposure with a, a single stove simply because they're exposed to lots of different other um, types of air pollution. And I, I think that speaks to what, what Hisham and, and a bit that Subrindu had touched on, like the, this idea of like the, the single stove or even just a cook stove or multiple cook stoves, the idea that this is going to be, you know, the, the silver bullet, I think is just not really a reasonable expectation. Um, and, and the same way that we would think about ambient air pollution, right? We wouldn't expect for, for an ambient air pollution uh, uh, evaluation, we wouldn't accept, expect that one policy was going to entirely eliminate the air pollution that exists in an urban setting, right? They're, they're, they're both complex and in different ways. There's lots of different sources in rural and peri-urban areas. There's lots of different sources in urban areas. Yeah, I, one last little point, and again, Jill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because this is more your area, is just also remembering that for some of the health outcomes we're concerned about, uh, the dose response curve is very much non-linear. And so you can be really much on the flat part of that that nonlinearity in the uh, you know on the flat part of that curve, so that if you reduce your air pollution by a significant amount from coming from the stove, you're still at basically very close to the same risk level, just because you haven't started going down that slope yet. Um, and so there's that piece of it as well, um, which a lot of people have sort of used to argue against uh, what are called improved cook stoves, which only improved if you know maybe double the efficiency from let's say 12% or 15% up to 30%. Well, that's great, you're doubling the efficiency, but if your your reductions in, in associated emissions uh, also just keep you on that same part of that curve, you're not really doing much from a health perspective. You are doing things from other perspectives, which is the important part before Sir Brendan jumps in here, as I know he probably wants to, right? There's a whole bunch of other benefits other than that air pollution benefit, right? And so uh, there's lots of reasons why those other stoves may still be something that people may want to, to move towards, um, uh, aside from the health. Another, so I'm, that's really interesting to me about the nonlinearity of the dose response function. So you're saying that for health, um, for health effects to really happen, to really, you need to reduce to some so what kind of nonlinearity then? So it's basically you need to get to a low enough level of um, indoor air pollution for it to, to really have health effects. Is that, is that right, Sean? Yeah, so basically the curve, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing with my finger here, right? The curve kind of does this and it flattens out really far, right? And, right, and if right, you're right. really far out on that curve, uh, but I'm on now off. Oh, screen. sure, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> to start off with, and you do, you go by half, you're still on the flat part of the curve, and then you you know eventually right, right. you get to the part where it starts to curve down, 
and and down way down here is where we have things like you know uh electricity you know which doesn't have emissions inside the house other than the food you're coming off the food you're cooking and maybe gas right and maybe you get some of these like improved highly highly improved biomass gasifier type stoves right but if you're way mm -hmm. up over here it's not all the it's not all the health effects, but, but but certainly some of them right yeah yeah, yeah. um you, you, you're, you're just not going to have that effect right and so uh, i mean and i was going to just add to that like just based on to put this in a little bit of uh a, a, and some perspective on the this exposure response curve or what that means is that in a lot of settings just ambient air pollution levels get you to a level that's at the point where that curve starts to become pretty flat right so so even if you you know reduce all of the indoor sources there you're still you know getting exposed to concentrations that are you know putting people along that really steep steep curve um, yeah, not exactly. for all, all health impacts but but that that certainly is a is a challenge for for trying to well both for conducting studies to try to understand exposure response relationships and and sort of where we need to get you know where we need to be um, in order to see a health benefit but um, also for you know making the case that this this particular intervention is going to improve health right because it 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 may be a really essential you know step in getting to health improvement but it it may not be sufficient on its own so can I ask two more questions so um in terms of the composition of the PM? Is that uh, some, I mean, I know that's probably more difficult and this is more of a question for the engineers and then we should probably maybe bring, I'm really interested in talking about these non-pollution benefits as well, right? But is there, is there a, a way to measure or is, and is there a reason to believe that, the, that this is a particularly harmful type of um, fine particulate matter that is um, coming out of these biomass stoves or, or not and then my second question is would would it make sense to to kind of have to really think about the externalities and try to target like entire neighborhoods or really try to um kind of do a randomized saturation intervention where you try to get um you know you because you can imagine that having if none of your neighbors are adopting it makes a lot less sense for you to adopt because you're just going to be breathing their um, their pollution anyway, but if you got a whole neighborhood together, you know, they're kind of increasing returns for a neighborhood um, to, to take up these kinds of um, technologies. I mean, I can talk about composition because we've, we've done a, a bit of work on this. Um, so I think a, a couple of things. Well, so a, a, the two different points, like one on community trials, like or, or community, yes, like policy is implemented not at a household scale, right? It's implemented at a community scale or even larger. And so I think um, any studies that we do now to evaluate uh, whether or not these technologies are working or not, it's almost always done at the village or community level. We don't like the household level stuff, I think um, for the most part, it, it's hard to translate those results to real life. Um, uh, but on the, on the composition side, I guess, so uh, we've done a bunch of work with evaluating the composition of, of PM from different settings, and, and you can use that to understand the sources that contribute, which I think is helpful for just understanding what these, you know, what the, the different settings look like, what people are exposed to. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, my, my colleague, Jamie Shower at the University of Wisconsin, who's led a lot of the, the composition work, I think I, what he has always said, and I, I, I largely agree with, is that while the composition stuff is exciting from a scientific perspective, like it's really in these settings, the pollution is so high, the focus should really just be on PM 2.5, like just getting PM 2.5 down. And then once you start to get PM 2.5 down to lower concentrations, then maybe thinking about composition in, in a more complex way makes sense. Um, and I think that, you know, I'll, I'll channel him on that. And, and I, I think that's largely been been his view and sort of advising on a on a, a global uh, global scale on on where people should prioritize. Like, should you pr prioritize elemental carbon or uh, organic carbon or you know metals? And he's just like focus on PM two point five, get that down. Um, but I, you know, the other thing that we found it useful for um, 
is uh, black carbon, which I, I know a bunch of people here work with, is a, the sort of soot component of PM 2.5. Um, and that's been a useful pollutant for a couple reasons. One is that there's some studies, including uh, some by us, showing that that soot component is more strongly associated with health impacts. That probably isn't the soot component itself. It's probably more correlated with other types of pollutants. Um, but, but it's a useful thing to measure because it's relatively inexpensive. Um, and you can actually measure that for at lower cost than PM 2.5. So um, it, it's useful in that respect, and it also has climate impacts. So people will, will often measure it as a, a pollutant that has both sort of regional climate impacts as well as potential health impacts. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to my colleagues to comment on this as well. So, so I don't know how 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 much stock to to, to place in this, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll tell you a little um, anecdote from 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 the perspective that's more from the user side. Uh, we did an, we did an, 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 we worked with an NGO uh, in in southern India to, who were doing an intervention of a of a rocket stove. So so just a, one of these sort of simply improved cook stoves. And our measurements showed. Really, kind of no real great reduction in 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 the the types of emissions that that we measure, right? Uh, and 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 Jill was involved in the study early early on, um, uh, and Andy, who's been mentioned in the, in the chat, whatnot, was was involved in this study, um, and we were like, well, yeah, it looks like it doesn't. There's no real kind of reduction in the in the in the pollutants. Uh, constituents of the pollutants that we care about from a, from usually from a health and air pollution perspective, from the PM 2.5 and stuff like that. And um, the NGO that we were working with, the head of the NGO that we were working with, came said, "Okay, that's all fine and good, but all of all all the people in the villages that we work in and we've been working in for many many years, all say they they feel like it's less smoky, right? Like it doesn't, you know, their, their eyes are not as as irritated as before and whatnot, right?" Uh, and so part of that, my, my initial reaction sometimes is say, well, you know, they're just saying what, what we want them to say, or we, they think we want to say, say, or because there's an improved cook, so they think it's got to be better. So they're sort of, just, sort of just a perception type, type of issue, right? But then I, I, was, I was interacting with, a, with an ophthalmologist who does a lot of work in, in India. And I said, you know, I was like, just, just curious, right? Like from, from an ophthalmologist perspective. Do we know like what is it in smoke that actually irritates people's eyes? And he's like, you know, I asked around a few people. And it's like, no, we got no idea, basically, <laughs> right? Um, so just from the, so I always have that in the back of my mind. Like, like we measure a small number of the pollutant. We we measure PM two point five as just this thing, right? And we measure black carbon as this thing, right? And, and, and smoke is this complex mix of all kinds of stuff, right? And and we actually and we focus on certain types of health outcomes, right? Uh, so I don't know if there's anything to that, but I do think that there's probably something to the fact that, that this is just yet another of these complexities where it's very possible that, that some of these stoves are actually reducing kind of the, the feeling of the smokiness of it, right? Uh, in ways that we can't even probably measure, um, even if they're not reducing some of the health outcomes that we actually care about. Well, that may be, we're not caring about the right health outcomes. <laughs> I mean, in this, in a sense, maybe this is a, it is real, and we're just not picking it up. Not saying that you're wrong at all, but yeah, yeah, that's a, that's interesting. Anic data is great. Um, so yeah, um, I think one of the things that that Jill mentioned was, um, you know, thinking about um, policy interventions really only makes sense to look at them at. Um, at the village level, right, or at the community level, because we're just not going to see um, air quality impacts um, at individual households, right? But but some of the other kinds of impacts that and benefits that we've um, that we talked about in the in the Twitter conversation, and that we, I think we we all are, at least I, I really want to talk about, um, are very well are easily measured at the individual level, at the household level, right? So how much time do women spend collecting firewood, right? Um, how do we value that half hour? Is that if 
if there are no health impacts, no air quality impacts whatsoever, but women, you know, 3 million billion, I don't know, what, what scale are we at here? I think somebody said billion, 3 billion women saving half an hour a day, um, collecting less fuel. I mean, you know, give them all the money, right? Like, I want to throw money at that. That sounds great. No health impacts, sign me up. I don't care, right? That's a huge win. So, um, yes, no. Do we value women's time when perhaps um, rural labor markets aren't really there? You know, what, what, is, what is the relevant metric for me measuring those benefits? Um, should we? Yeah. Anyone? Subrano has his hand up, so he's had it for a while, so I'm going to... Pass it over to you. So I, I don't I, I I I do want to get into non-health benefits of uh, technologies like stoves, but I did want to make a plug for some of the questions on the Q and A, and to make the point again yeah, that please. just because we've had a few studies that show X, Y, and Z reductions or not, and not sufficiently significant reductions, has not is not the final word on this, right? So we have a study in, in the Gangetic Plains of India where, so, so two points, right? Whenever someone is talking about electric stoves or LPG, um, there's a whole host of people who say, well, those are aspirational technologies for a lot of the world. True, but South Asia, <laughs> Many countries are electrifying. Many countries are pushing LPG. So it's it's still uh, that three billion is going to get knocked down to two billion or a bill or a billion. You know that's that's a lot of people who might get this new technology. And in those cases, you are seeing two, three, four hundred percent reduction. Okay, from six hundred parts per million to forty-eight. Forty-eight is bigger than thirty-two, but it's still a heck of a lot of reduction in air pollution, right? So. There are technologies, and we have a study that's you know getting kicked around the journals, which which is on, on induction cooking, right, in Uttar Pradesh, which has unreliable electricity, but reliable enough that people are using this technology. Yes, they're still stacking, but they're using it enough for enough minutes in the day that the air pollution goes down significantly. Right? Okay, several hundreds of uh, parts per million. I cannot give you this result because science embargo stuff while it's in review, so sorry. But that said, clean doesn't mean that, that that's the only aspect of a, a stove. As you said, Emilia, we, you know, talk to women who are hauling big piles of wood on their head and bringing it home every day. If they have to haul something smaller like uh, just maybe every other day rather than every day or a smaller pile because this technology actually uses a little less wood or a few or less twigs uh, unless you believe that one hour or 30 minutes or 45 minutes our mean estimate and i can talk about the study in a second if if we have time uh, is of no value to humans or to society this, this is just an absurd argument to, to make that, no, 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 don't waste your time on those technologies, they fail. They fail with what, they fail on what, on what grounds? They fail to deliver a WHO recommendation for air pollution at this level, in this, at this point in time. But they're delivering other things. And, and as, as people who are working in this sector, who are trying to look for new ways to, you know, they, you can't blanket sort of walk away from the sector because that just cuts out R and D, more research, more work, you know, that, because it's it's a whole ecosystem that sort of operates around people paying attention and trying to tweak and improve things all the time. If you step away and say, no, 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 these are too dirty, there's no reason to mess with it, it just shuts down a whole sort of, you know, uh, process of sort of innovating adapting, changing, improving, et cetera, et cetera, right? Can I just step in here for, for a second? So, so one is just to make a slight correction. So 3 billion, close to up to 3 billion, depending on what you want to count, uh, people. So it's not, that's not all just women, right? So, so 3 billion people, that's the whole household, basically. That's, that's there. So, so take one fifth of that or something like that if you want to talk about it. Uh, the second is um, we, we, 
often talk about the default is talk about the 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 female head of household or the wife of the household or whatever is being the person who goes out and collects. Not always true. There are places in the world where men actually collect instead of, instead of women. There's places where women collect kind of the daily stuff and men go off for larger trips to collect sort of larger collect, uh, pieces of collection. Uh, there's also children, right? So, so there's also like school age girls, which is a really important uh, uh, piece of this. We, we did a study a long time ago, which we actually never ended up publishing, uh, on, on time use, which did not find an effect. If you, if you lived in a household that relied on biomass for cooking, there was no effect on whether or not uh, girls of a certain age went to school, but there was an effect on how much time they spent on homework, right? Uh, which was quite interesting. Um, intensive, intensive margin and extensive margin. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, but the other thing I'm going to say is I want to I want to pick up on 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 one thing you said, and it's a minor technical point. And I'm not going to try. I'm not trying to, to slag economists, right? But uh, you said something to the effect of should we value uh, women's time, uh, and you linked it to labor markets, right? And and actually having labor markets there. And so there's 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 something really kind of deep in that in some senses, right? Because one is uh, no, there's not often a labor market. You can't necessarily turn an extra half an hour a day into like additional wages. There's no, there's no labor market there necessarily that people are not going to just go off and get a job, right? Um, and so there's two parts of that. One is how do we value that time in terms of putting a number on it? And it usually is at something, doing something like that. The problem with that is women cannot turn those 30 minutes into the, ex, the equivalent amount of extra money needed in order to buy the stove to save the 30 minutes. Right? So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem there. Um, the second is that oftentimes people are also, women people are suffering from time poverty. They have so many tasks during their day that extra 30 minutes, their best use of that time may not be to go and get a job and, and, and bring in extra cash, right? It's, it may even actually be leisure time, like having just those 30 minutes to just relax or get 30 minutes extra sleep Right, because they're up until 10 o'clock at night or 10:30 at night, trying to get household chores done or whatever it is, or or you know they can spend socializing, or or there's a bunch of other tasks that they can spend doing. So I, I think we have to be really careful about both the assumption around how we value that time from a technical perspective, from doing a cost-benefit analysis on pen and paper, but also how we think people are actually going to use that time, and then. And the fact that they can't turn that into the money needed in order to buy the stove to save them the time is a, is is a, is where subsidies come in. I'll right, and so so and I absolutely mentioned labor markets to poke you to get that exact comment because I wanted to respond to that ever since our tweet conversation and I wanted to do it in person, you know, because Twitter oh, too much. Um, even though that was it was great, and I'm gonna say. I don't care what she does with them or he or they, you know, I'm going to keep talking about women because that's sort of the, you know, what I have in mind when I think of these contexts, but it, it doesn't matter whoever it is that's saving that time. Economics would say, and cost benefit analysis when done correctly would say, it doesn't matter if she uses it for leisure time, if she goes out and earns money in the labor market, et cetera. It is, you know, whether she's getting benefits from that, right? If it's her spending half an hour talking to her kids, great. If she, you know, use it for leisure, great. All of those things are benefits, right? That makes them harder to quantify than if she were getting a wage. But we do, you know, cost benefit studies do time savings calculations all the time, right? For any any highway you've ever seen a cost, you know, the cost benefit analyses for for, for building new roads, improving them, um, better. Um, thingamajig, um, but it, toll boots or whatever, make it save people half an hour of commuting time. People in the private sector, and I mean, anyone who isn't someone who's on a consulting, you know, bill by the half hour kind of job, nobody can clock in that extra half hour. We still count it, right? At their wage rate or at some, you know, some, some transformation of the wage rate. It's not because they can earn that money with that half hour. That's irrelevant. It's, you know, that is just a way to turn that into a dollar amount. And I understand your point about, you know, 
is it enough? Can they go out and buy the cook stove? Maybe not, but would they want to if they had the money, right? If we had functioning credit markets, right? Is this something that people would buy if they could spread it out and um, borrow and, and you know, pay for it over time with a reasonable interest rate, right? Like it's the willingness to pay and the unconstrained with functioning credit markets, willingness to pay that is the relevant cost benefit, social welfare measure of, um, of that benefit to my mind, right? So um, should society invest in these? Yes or no? The, that question should be weighed against that kind of valuation, I think. So Brando, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the last thing you said, Amelia, there. And, um, so two, two things. Firstly, social cost benefit perspective, which is, I think it's, it's great when Hisham, who you know, always claims he doesn't know economics, but he explains economics more clearly than most economists, which is helpful then, right? That women's, just because the market isn't complete doesn't mean that there isn't a shadow price or shadow value associated with a person's time, which is, you know, that's sort of the typical old school World Bank reaction if there is no market working, so that time must be worth nothing, right? Which is not true. It's worth a lot. Whatever it is, even like watching TV, because you know, you all we all watch Netflix, so we obviously value it. So if someone else watches a soap opera in the middle of nowhere, then that's worth it. The point is that that whether you monetize it exactly or not, which which is a project we we are just have launched in in four four East African locations, uh, it it becomes a mechanism to draw in development finance, right? So this is where development impact bonds, the fact that there is a misconnect between the private markets functioning, uh, you know, what you were saying, Hisham, that she saves 30 minutes and this is not running out to work on someone else's farm and bringing 30 minutes worth of wages home, but there is social value. So some donor in Norway or, in Sydney or you know wherever uh, Subu is in in Doha, is saying, hey, we actually value that, and I'm willing to co-finance that, right? I'm willing to put that money up because I think that money should be that value should be realized, and this is where development impact bonds come in, and and if there's more work in the sector, then better stores will will evolve, and they will, as Jill said earlier. These stoves are bringing you to the threshold, right? A reduction from 600 to 300 is, 300 is much bigger than 32, but 300 is a lot less than 600. So next, th this will incentivize someone else to say, let's bring it down to 150 or, you know, or 78 or something, right? It, it, that, that the, the sector doesn't come close down. And I posted a link on the blog that we had written, Jorg, Jorg and Mark and I on, you know, not all cook stoves go, go up in smoke in the sense that let's not, that there's, there's other stuff to achieve, yeah. Jill, Jill go ahead. Had your hand up, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I just had two, two comments on this and this a little bit reflects the, the Twitter conversation as well, which is that in particularly for anything that burns biomass, I think, it, it would be wrong to assume that it doesn't increase air pollution because I think that's a big challenge with this, right? Because some of these stoves actually increase levels of air pollution. And I'm not talking about like the stove plus stacking. I'm just talking like that stove itself is worse than a traditional, some traditional stoves. And so I'd say like, that's a, and, and it might be the, you know, the way that people use them is different from how they were tested in the lab or they fall apart really quickly. There are like many, many reasons, but I, I think like at a, that that's a really important aspect of this, right? Because, you know, when it comes down, like air pollution is associated with a lot of health impacts, including pneumonia, the, you know, number one cause of child death for children under five, like that, that, that is, I think a, it's important not to make that assumption, um, especially for a cost benefit analysis. And then I guess the other thing that I'll add, and I, I, I am, um, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I think often for studies looking at health, um, you know, we're we're really only uh, statistically powered 
because the, these studies are hard to do, they're expensive, right? Like uh, there's a lot of measurements that have to be done. We're often, you know, we're modeling the mean effects of these things, right? And we really seldom look at distributional effects. And, and it, it is, I mean, I think social scientists do this better than we have on the health side, but like, what are, what is the, you know, the very poor, the worst off in our study population, are they benefiting the same as people that are wealthier? And, and at least the times that we've evaluated this, which is not often, but we looked at this, for example, in Beijing, and the poor were worse off than the wealthy. Um, they, this was a heating intervention, you know, they had colder indoor temperatures, they had higher levels of air pollution, they were more likely to, you know, have a higher proportion of their income that was going towards, the, which means that they're not spending it on like children's school fees and, and other things. So, um, I mean, I, I again, I'll, I, I think social scientists have done this better, but but we need to figure out a way in, in all of these studies to try to better look at some of these distributional effects, because if they really are making the poor worse off, that, I mean, that is certain when you're talking about cost benefit analysis and all of these, that, that is not the direction that we, we should be going with these types of policies, especially if it's implemented on sort of a national scale. No, that's, a, that, yeah, that's a great point. I, um, I do remember your comment in the, in the thread and I, but, but I, yeah, I was thinking of, of the assumption that yes, you know, they're no better or, or better, but, um, but either way, I think, um, yeah. Surrender, I think you wanted to. No, Hisham has his hand up. It's hidden oh, behind. Oh, brilliant! The first Sorry, missed that. Now. Thanks for you're a better moderator than I am. Clearly. <laughs> Thanks, no. Worry. I, so I don't. I guess I, I don't want to belabor this point, but I, I just want to pick up on something Surrender said, which is I think exactly the right thing, which is my issue with this whole valuation of, of, of time is uh, a, 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 a couple different things. Uh, is, is stuff that I had seen that sort of said, well, look, the cost benefit, you know, benefit cost ratio is, is so high, right? People should just get the stoves. Well, yeah, but they can't. So we need policy to deal with that, right? So development bonds or subsidies or something, right? So, so it's, it's a moving from there to policy, which I think really we need to push much harder on um, in terms of thinking about uh, how, to, how, to overcome, how to overcome that. Um, the second is an open question in my mind as to, what should be that value of that time? Whether whether the whether actually it is the wage rate, right? Because one is if your wage rate calculation is based on there being some sort of actually functioning labor market, or there's no function, or or the labor market is lousy, and you're kind of undervalue, you, you may undervalue the time, right? Um, and, and especially if you're talking about uh, being constrained in terms of time poverty, those other things that people might spend that time on might be much more valuable to them than the actual prevailing wage rate. So we may actually be undervaluing some of these things, right? I mean- Absolutely, you know, yeah. It's, it's thinking for myself, like, you know, I, I'm allowed because of my job, I'm allowed to do a little bit of consulting work, right? If I have to spend some time doing that consulting work on the weekend, my rate is gonna jump a lot right? because my leisure time is pretty valuable to me, right? Uh, compared to whether I can spend the time uh, an hour at work. So, you know, I think we really need to be uh, careful about thinking about how we move from that calculation to a policy that actually addresses these issues. And we haven't, you know, think we, we haven't talked about forest and climate. So at some point in time, maybe during the Q&A, if it comes up, we should probably talk about those things as well, because that's a big issue. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just plant my flag to say, uh, I don't actually think we should be worried about climate so much uh, when it comes to this problem. Uh, especially when it comes to the solution side of this problem. Um, uh, climate is a great ancillary benefit, uh, but not should not be driving our, our conversations. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> Mike has appeared out of, you know, like a- Out of the ether. Give an aura with that background. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks everyone for, for this really great conversation. Um, I just, I think this is probably a good place to to, to cut this and, and shift over to you know see if we can answer any outstanding questions. Um, there were a bunch that were answered already by uh, Subu and I, but um, in, in the Q and A box itself. But uh, if any attendees have any more um, that they they any more questions that they want to ask, do so. Um, if we can also scroll through the chat a little bit as well. Um, I know. Uh, 
I'm sorry, uh, Eric Reynolds here had had a number of comments and I wonder if anyone wanted to um, jump in and uh, uh, comment on those. I've, I've tried to answer a few of them. So um, I think in some other, Hisham has also taken a shot of, at a few of them. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I, I think well, just just responding to, to a couple of things that are, were in those those questions uh, that 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 certainly affordability is 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 a big issue, but it's not the it's not the only it's not the only issue. Um, there's lots of pros and cons of switching from uh, the the type of cooking that you've been used to and have grown up with to a different type of cooking stove. But even if you could solve the affordability problem. Uh, there's how does it you know how does it cook uh, compared to you know in, in terms of different different types of foods that you're cooking. There's there's a whole host of of other issues. Uh, in some cases, there's infrastructural issues that you have to deal with uh, with regard to fuel supplies or moving towards something where you have to purchase fuels and these kinds of things that are outside of the household's control. Uh, we've got a paper we're working on right now that's usually a, sort of a behavior change model to look at some of these questions, uh, which actually shows there's some some definite non uh, wealth-based uh, factors that, that, that play into whether or not uh, how people see the pros and cons of, of, of a switch to LPG, for example. Um, so, so, so there's definitely some, some stuff there that, that that needs to be dealt with. And 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 yes, there's a big focus on tier four, but but I think as Brendan was was saying, there's there's also value to also looking at things that are cleaner or improved or improved in ways that are not so much around the health effects because there's all these other things going on that we need to pay attention to and and transitional technologies like that if we're talking about this is a long-term problem um, may be important to think about yeah so um since we don't have any questions i'm just gonna keep talking um but i wanted to i wanted to tie back to what you were saying hisham about time poverty and how that might actually you know that would lead us to and, and that is exactly what that would lead us to undervalue the benefits of time savings, for example. Um, and, and I absolutely agree, right? That would, I mean, the Lagrangian is like the, I mean, the, that constraint is actually more binding then. And so um, that would suggest that um, it's even more beneficial. But the thing that I wanted to, to, because I'm new to this world. And so I hadn't heard, I didn't know what stacking meant until like a couple of days ago. And so everyone seems to hate stacking, right? And like, that's, you know, Right, so good, not, not, not everyone here, but in general, it's like a bad word, right? And so we need to get rid of the stacking because it's what's keeping households, um, you know, what keeping the air bad. I mean, maybe in, a, in an ideal world, first, you know, great, let's get everyone super clean, you know, four cook plates, awesome. But if, you, if I had only one cook plate and you gave me another one, heck yeah, I'm gonna use both of them, <laughs> right? And that just suggests that like, Households were operating under, you know, they were at a constrained optimum, right? They were, they only had one cook stove and they were cooking optimally only that. You gave them cook, two cook stoves and they used both of them. And so that is a utility increase, right? Like that is a benefit to households and probably also entails a time savings as well, right? Um, just being able to cook two things in parallel as opposed to one thing at a time. And so um, perhaps in the, the number of hours that you were exposed um, matters as well maybe that decreases i don't know but just pointing out the sort of the utility increase that comes with stacking is i mean by revealed preferences households are doing this they so so they are valuing it they they're benefiting from it otherwise they wouldn't they would just use one right but um i think that is something that i think is worth modeling and worth thinking about a little bit more carefully um there's there's a comment that ended up in the chat instead of in the q a and so um, mentioning that modeling studies show that climate change mitigation um, might slow down the transition to clean cooking fuels. Um, and if anyone has any comments on that, I think, great, thank you for, sure. for the question. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I, can, I can comment that real quickly. I, 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 there's at least one thing, there's, I, I'm assuming this is what this person is referring to, um, is that a lot of the climate modeling studies, of course, uh, impose climate policy by imposing a, a carbon tax. Um, and so if you impose a carbon tax, so, so for example, there's at least one study I'm aware of, uh, that if you impose a carbon tax uh, on uh, 
and, and that will apply to LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. So this is the gas cylinders are kind of like your propane tanks, but slightly different mixture. Um, and which is, which is uh, a, a very uh, major part of the solution space for a lot of countries, India, for example, um, and others. And so if you impose a carbon tax, you slow the, you know, just from an economic household affordability perspective, you will, you slow the uptake and adoption of, of LPG, uh, unless you, unless you account for that in your carbon tax policy. So if you just apply a blanket carbon tax, for example, that, that will, so there's at least one study showing that, and I'm sure there's others as well um, for other, other, uh, other fuels. Actually, and I'll, I'll, the comment about hate, hating stacking or, or like that we, we hate stacking. Um, so I guess one thought, I don't, I don't really hate stacking. I mean, stacking is happening because there's massive shifts to LPG and clean stoves, right? I mean, and, and this is like, People who are doing, in fact, there's a in our study where we evaluated a semi gasifier stove. So air pollution looked worse than the control group because the entire control group switched to LPG during the evaluation period. So just over a three year period, they all started using LPG in in place of this. The the the, the intervention group was using the the semi gasifier stove. Um, so I you know in in India the, you know there's a um, Actually, there's a large trial that's happening right now. And I know this was a challenge for their trial was trying to find sites for India that were still using biomass and that weren't being enrolled into these massive government programs. Um, you know, the shift's happening. Like people are people are shifting to, to clean fuels. And, and as part of that, as you're saying, like they're continuing to use their traditional stoves as many of us do. Like, you know, we use our charcoal grill or, or you know, whatever else is, is in our homes. But, um, but I think, I think, and 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 I've worked on this topic with with people that are here, but but we've spent a lot of time understanding what are the factors that contribute to the uptake of these clean fuels. But then the question is sort of what are the things that make it more likely for people to stop using solid fuels, right? So if you really want to make those you know large health increases or maximize the health benefits that are going to come from these things, and like we've shown, we've had studies showing like. It turns out if you you know marriage or death of a family member, those are times when you're more likely to suspend solid fuel in China. And I think understanding those kinds of things are really important, right? Because then you know, oh, okay, if we want to market this or if we have an intervention, like these are places or times in life that we could actually intervene. And I think increasing our understanding now that people are starting to like uh, increasingly uh, using LPG or gas or electricity and, and other types of clean stoves, like what are the factors that lead to either clean stacking or or the disadoption of of uh, of solid fuel? Yeah, I mean, I think we it's, it's also a little bit strange to think of or have this idea that as soon as somebody gets a you know a new technology like this that is a substitute technology, or, but it's actually not. It's a complement technology in many cases, and. The idea is they're going to all of a sudden wholesale just switch over as opposed to go through a process, right, of initially using it for certain cooking tasks, eventually getting used to it, eventually overcoming their concerns about the availability of gas, for example, and move on. So I'm going to make a plug for the work of uh, a former PhD student of, of mine, Abhishek Carr, who's now at Columbia, uh, where we've been using the behavior change models to try to understand this. We have a paper we're working on right now. Uh, where we actually look at, at a five-stage process, right, where, 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 where people kind of are thinking about it or even haven't thought about it, then they start thinking about change, you're getting LPG and using it regularly, and then they're sort of in a stage where they're, they're, they've gotten the LPG stove, they're using it, a, a, you know, uh, at, a certain, at a certain point, um, and, and then they get to a stage where they're actually kind of are able to regularly maintain that behavior of, of using it on, um, uh, on a regular basis. The idea that we're going to just have this wholesale switch like this just because of new technology is available just doesn't, doesn't 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 fit with how we know people behave, right? The fix Subu has a question. Just a quick response on this yeah. stacking thing, Amelia. In our study, um, even when they're stacking, there's tremendous improvements in air quality. So all of us stack. It's not a bad word. Excellent. Maybe this might just be like the pro, maybe I, we just have the pro stacking crowd here. <laughs> I felt like on Twitter, there was a lot of stacking. 
hate. <laughs> Sue, well, I, I, not, I mean, it's I, not I, pro or con. I'm not pro stacking. I'm just saying it's a fact of life. Let's just move. I on. know. Yeah. I know. I'm just. Yeah, and, and, I mean, I, I certainly have papers where we're, we said, you know, if you want to reach the levels that people say you need to reach in order to have health benefits, then you can't have any stacking, and therefore, what would it take to get exclusive usage? I've certainly written stuff like that. It, it's, but that's the framing of the paper to understand, like, what does it take to get exclusive usage, right? Which is different than saying stacking is bad. Stacking totally. Is bad. It's, it's what happens. Yeah, I also think that's a little bit of the artifact of trials, right? So the trials are trying to create this perfect world, right? Because they want to like most perfect, only use clean fuel compared with only using polluting fuel. And, you know, they're trying to evaluate, the, but like, that's just not the way the world works, right? right then stay in the lab the then. With trials, right? <laughs> I mean, I like, but I think it, you're, you're getting, this is an artifact of probably having a bunch of people that do a lot of observational work, right? Um, which is that we want to understand how these things play out in the real world and, and how would you, you know, develop policies to, to better address them. So what are the things that if, if you all had, um, you know, what are the, if you had a, your, your top choice of things that every cook stove study going forward should, should include or should measure is it, I mean, cause it seems like, although there's overlap, there's, there's a lot of also heterogeneity in terms of how people measure uh, certain outcomes, certainly the behavioral outcomes, right? Is there, and maybe I just don't know it, maybe there is, and I don't know about it, but is there any kind of clearinghouse or sort of a, you know, some sort of coordination around, uh, let's make sure to all include these measurements so that we can compare across contexts, because like Surrender pointed out uh, in, in some of the Q&A, yes, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity. It's not that things work or don't work. They work in some places, they don't work in others. And Jill pointed out another dimension of heterogeneity might, might work differently for different parts of the distribution um, and so on. So is there an effort of that kind? Could there be an effort? And if so, what, um, what would be on your list of things to, to roll out across, uh, across studies? Yeah, I just, I just want to hop in before we start on this discussion. Um, nominally, we'd scheduled this for 90 minutes, an hour and a half. Um, I think it's probably OK if we go a little over. Um, but yeah, just, just keep that in mind. Thanks. I'm still awake, so. <laughs> So at this point, it's just probably just the six of us talking to each other. But um, I took a stab at answering Subhu's question in, in the chat. And let me repeat that. So if you, if folks remember Mike's first table, which had the technology and it showed these household level effects, these regional level effects, and these cli global climate level effects. So it is actually one technology that does a lot of things and, and to, to differential degrees. And for sure, if you could measure everything, you should, right? But I'm also going to be the same person who has fought back to funding agencies saying, you want us to do, we, we can't, right? With this amount of money and this kind of timeline, we can't measure all these. So I would think that not every study should be measuring everything, just they should fully acknowledge what they are not and not dismiss what they're not as something stupid, right? They should acknowledge that they're not touching that. Like we didn't do health in, in our Himalayan trial and we were just very clear. There's a lot of other studies that are doing that. We don't want to get into that. People will, will find that, right? And, and then the other, other point is that, but someone should be tracking what is the menu of outcomes that are being measured? Because I would personally say that I think there is perhaps an overwhelming emphasis on air pollution and health and, and for good reasons, but overwhelming, right? Then there's, we are not tracking some of these other things as much as we could, including forest outcomes and wildlife and, and birds and bees. You know, if the forest is being degraded, that's pro probably being affected. We have no idea in any sort of quasi-experimental careful evaluation, whether there are less butterflies, less salamanders, less something or the other when the forests are being affected. If you didn't care about forests and only cared about women's time, you know, we only have an observational sort of suggestive evidence and we don't even have anything resembling 
you know, zero studies across the world, right? I mean, there are anecdotal comments here and there. So I would think that in general, across the sector, someone should be tracking this and who's that, the Clean Cook Stove Alliance maybe, or CCA or the World Bank, some of these pan uh, multinational organizations. But not everybody, every study should be tracking everything. It's just going to be, you're going to make, you're going to mess it up for any one thing that you're studying because course right and it's you know oh how many women are benefited like i know the reporting requirement through the world bank how many women have been benefited from this intervention all that you know it's just a lot of it's also just numbers but so i was thinking that the things that you feel are are really valuable enough that like to have across multiple studies and and perhaps you know there could be some some in fact some of the air quality um low cost air quality monitors that we're rolling out in Nairobi is, is very much a, 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 share, a shared venture where I had money to roll out X many, but I wanted more than that. And there were others who were interested in the same thing. And we sort of put our money together uh, for a great, you know, for a greater cause and we're sort of sharing them. Um, I have a few other studies where, you know, I've added questions to someone else's survey. I, you know, you can pay for the incremental. There's a lot of fixed costs in running these big studies. And so, um, there could be models where by cooperating, you can include more questions, of course, to a limit, you know, and, and there's, um, you know, as surveys get longer costs, you know, it gets too much, but there may be questions that, um, that are just important enough to have across contexts that, that it'd be, but yeah, anyway. Um, any, did you have thoughts on that, Jill? Um, I was I was I was laughing Measures. because um, because you you so we were evaluating a natural experiment right now um, and we invited social scientists to participate and uh, and they sent their survey to me and as someone who had always been like we don't do more than a one page I'm a measurement person but measurement <laughs> on like the air quality and like they sent the survey and I'm I'm like one page you know like we do one page we get through it quick and they sent this and I was like oh my god. <laughs> 30 long. pages yeah <laughs> my surveys are usually how are we gonna do that how long is this gonna take like I mean we we have it it it, it is it's longer than anything I've ever done before but I think that the information that we're getting from that is just incredibly rich and I, I as someone who I mean I think I I'm not I had I didn't have a ton of experience in developing surveys like I'd always taken other people's surveys right. and implemented them and cut questions um and focus, <laughs> focus much more on the the health and and um like the essential confounders that we need to measure and really focus on the air quality and health um but I I totally agree with you in the sense that like opening up that that I mean we had a you know it was uh, 1200 households in 50 villages and so opening that up to social scientists and being able to collect data that we wouldn't otherwise have has been i mean it's it's yeah it's questions that i think we should be asking in household energy around some of these distributional effects around sort of income and what that you know what the impacts of these these things are on um on income and 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 opportunities but um and but i guess just to your question about like what should we measure um i mean I, I, I think it really depends on the study, but the one thing I will say that is if you're evaluating a stove and health impacts, you really need to measure air pollution. And, and it's because if you don't see a health impact, then what do you do with that if you didn't measure air pollution? Like, is it because there's not an ideological association between the two? Is it that, you know, air pollution didn't decrease? Is it because there was you know, changes in other risk factors for that health outcome. And so I think that that is the the one that I'd say is really essential if you're looking at those two. If and and publishing, I can't stress this enough, like publishing the air pollution results alongside the health outcomes, because otherwise it's just left entirely open to interpretation. And it makes it makes it really hard to sort of say, like, well, we think this is what happened in this study. And, and trials are expensive and, and, and intervention evaluations are expensive. And you need to know what what happened there. And especially if it involves social scientists, then you're use, you're also using participants time. <laughs> and so it's expensive in that dimension, too. Sorry, oh, Sprendo, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Also, our our scientific process and community has to be much more accepting of uh, null results and no results, no no results, because those are results, right? I mean, you, this is a learning process and sort of the hunt for the significance and impacts is 
is just perverse. It just makes it harder to, right? There, there are studies which are, don't have statistically significant outcomes, but that is a, that, that's a finding, right? It should be out there just in the menu of distribution of findings, right? Yeah, when I, when it, I teach replicability and, of things, yeah. and sorry, when I teach replicability and transparency of social science, right? One of the, I have two key examples for why the file drawer problem is, is a huge issue you know, um, free textbooks in schools and cook stoves, right? If you have one study that finds huge positive impacts and 20 that don't, and only the one that, um, that finds impacts gets published, right? Um, by cook stoves. So that, so that was, so thus far, um, my, my main knowledge of, of cook stoves. Go ahead, Hisham, sorry. Interrupted yeah, no, just, 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 no, no. I, I mean, just to follow up on, on Serena's point is also, what do we consider as, evidence right it, it it does if it doesn't you know the idea, you know if it doesn't come from an rct does it count kind of and all that kind of other stuff right i mean like you know i think we need to be much more pluralistic in terms of what we think about in terms of providing evidence around the, the rich rich uh um complex decision making policy and technical space that that this is qualitative studies ethnographic studies right observational studies or descriptive studies all have a place right it is you know uh restricting our, our idea of evidence to something that was a gold quote unquote gold standard rct with the statistical significance of x with power of y you know is really limiting us in thinking about what this problem actually looks like uh globally and so i i just make a you know because i think a lot of times actually our and this happens also in the electricity access space. I, I actually have a, a big issue with, with the way some of the RCTs are, are being kind of framed and discussed in terms of their outcomes, in terms of what they're saying, um, simply because they're, they are, uh, they're, you know, they're, you're trying to limit the thing that you're actually measuring in order to be able to measure it sometimes in an RCT, right? This is the, this is the one outcome I'm going to look at, right? And, and it misses a whole bunch, but that's a whole other conversation. Probably have a whole other webinar on that. Um, I was going to say, you, you, you <laughs> launched this at me now and we're done. Like, you know, bring it um, on. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm not you know, to sleep now. Our, our good, our good friend, our good friend, uh, Jorg and I have gone back and forth on this a couple of times. Uh, we should uh, have a conversation uh, on, about on this question. because. Yeah, yeah, uh, but we should have, that's a whole other conversation. I, I just, uh, and, and Subu has put something in the, in the chat, I just want to point out, uh, referencing Kirk Smith's op-ed, which was called In Defense of LPG. And I, I don't. I, I'm sort of technology agnostic. I, I, I want, I go with what, what I think kind of works and I'm trying to understand how, what, what, but also more, what are co governments doing, for example, and, and what's the impact of that? So let's say the Indian government's program on, on LPG, but I do think very much so that LPG is a major part of the solution space. Uh, I know there's a big move, for example, I find it really interesting that in North America, there's a big move away from gas. The gas is so terrible. It's so polluting. We need to ban gas in new builds. In the context of North America, that makes a lot of sense, right? Go electric only for buildings, don't have any interest in new gas. Is that because, because the ambient is clean enough that that really is becoming a major source? In a place like India or Sub-Saharan Africa, LPG is a major, major difference in terms of the reduction in, in the, in the um, air quality. And I'm going to throw another little bomb in there. It's actually not a climate problem, even though it's a fossil fuel. Um, and we could, that's a, that's a whole other conversation, but it actually turns out to really not be an issue, an issue. Uh, it, it, because of the levels of consumption, but also because there's climate impacts of the, of the biomass that you're offsetting. Um, so while climate should not be the driver, it also not, shouldn't be something that we worry about when it comes to solutions. And then I will stop. Because we're running out of time. You are on fire. <laughs> you're just, um, what do we think folks? um should we wrap it up this has been so much fun like it's way past my bedtime and i'm not even you know i could keep going but i think you know to be the attendees who actually stayed with us this far i think we should give them a high five and say thank you for um for for staying with us um and for coming in the first place i think i learned a lot from you guys i thought it was really nice to talk to you all in person ish you know uh more in person than twitter anyway um 
thank you all and thanks to Mike and Subu and Africa Air for, for organizing this. Um, any, any concluding thoughts, anyone? I'm not going to conclude. I, I, <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I well, thank, thank you to, to Africa Air and, and, and for you to, for, 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 for moderating and for you know, Subu and Mike and uh, Scott to, for, for, the, for um, setting this up. Um, and it's always a, a pleasure to talk to Subrendu and Jill. Um, it's, uh, it's always a lot of fun and I always learn something. So thank not you. Me. <laughs> well, I thank you. I thank you at the beginning. I thank you at the beginning for moderating and doing all that stuff. Oh, I, I know. Thank you. I, I just got left you. out. But thank you again. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. No, no, it's, I'm totally kidding. Thank you. Hisham um, is very good at uh, not missing things like that, Emilia. So he he's no, no. To, I I just I'm just really air, good at being a long time. <laughs> And so and Jill, so he got it all, and I just wanted to second all that, and ask uh, Mike and Subu if um, if this is going to be recorded, and so you know we could recapture some of this, and you know some of these conversations circle again and again and again. It'd be nice to replay it and say, "Hey guys, look at this. It's it's yeah. It's not just me, right? <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Right. So and, this and, is recorded. Um, I think that the panelists should all touch base uh, maybe tomorrow and decide if we want to um, you know share this just amongst ourselves or make it publicly available but oh I think um, we should well I don't know we don't have to decide I'm now totally but fine. I, yeah. so I, didn't I assume that, that it would be public. public I would have yeah. sounded even crazier if not yeah okay then yeah um, I think I don't think Africa has a has a YouTube channel yet but I guess that's something I can make and we can throw it up on there Brilliant. And we can all tweet about it. It'll be great. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Fun. Thanks for the invitation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of fun. Bye. Bye. Bye.